Uh, right now, he's not going to be the top guy. Yes, sir. There she goes. Hello and welcome to episode 292 of section 138. I'm your host, Mark Colley. As always, joined by Bryson. We're alternating weeks here. Bryson, Jacob, Bryson, Jacob. This week, we've got Bryson. And Bryson, how are you doing? Doing good, Mark. Uh, it was definitely a interesting weekend, of course, of what happened in Cincinnati. But of course, things ended off pretty good in terms of how that third game went. But of course, when you look at it now, something that we haven't, I guess, said in quite a long time is that the Blue Jays are officially outside or the on the outside of looking in on a playoff spot. The good news is, of course, they had they went two to three this weekend. And as much as they haven't uh, I guess overtaken Seattle again to this point. They are also have caught up to Houston, and they're only one game behind Houston as well. So those last two wild card spots right now are definitely up for grabs, and uh, the Jays remain involved, of course, in the playoff race. But now we all know what's coming up this week in Baltimore. We all know the, I guess, the history uh, this season. Pretty much is what happened between both teams. So. It's going to be another huge series, and uh, you don't want to fall out of this. You want to stay right involved, and you want to get back into that playoffs but as soon as you can. Yeah, that's kind of the big story from this weekend. For the first time in what seems like forever, we actually have movement in the wild card race. And of course, it's not movement that favors the Blue Jays. You mentioned it now. As things stand, the Rays remain five games up in the wild card race. In the first wild card spot, the Houston Astros are a half game up. In the second wild card spot, and then Seattle is sitting pretty at the third wild card spot. And now the Jays are out of the playoff picture. They're a half game back of the Mariners. Mariners have been on the terror. They've won six straight, seven of their last 10. They've been uh, doing really well, and they got a series coming up against the Chicago White Sox, so it's only going to get easier for them. And then, of course, don't look now, but the Boston Red Sox right behind the Blue Jays just swept the New York Yankees, so they've won three in a row. They're 7-3 and three in their last 10, and, of course, three games back at the Blue Jays. So it's a tight picture, and for the first time in a little bit, we've seen movement, and we may yet see more movement i'm sure we will and i mean hopefully for our sakes we do because the blue jays are not in the playoff picture as things stand now but uh yeah they kind of they, they really needed to win this series in cincinnati like this was not a pushover uh, a pushover series cincinnati is very much in this race they're in the race for their own division and they are certainly in the race for the wild card at the end of this series they are a game back of the third wild card spot in the in the National League, but you go back to the start of this series and they were in a virtual tie for that third wild card spot. So they're very much still in the hunt. They're a pretty good team this season, although obviously they have their holes just as the Blue Jays do. And so this was always going to be an important series. I think it kind of snuck up on some people, and uh, thankfully the Blue Jays were able to take two of three, including with a big offensive night in the series finale. It was, and it was a good way to end it. And again, we're at the the part of the cycle where they have the the one game stretch where they put up ten runs, and then it disappears for another ten games after that. So that's, uh, I guess, the part that sucks about it. Of course, hopefully things change uh, in Baltimore, but it didn't. It didn't start off well. Pretty much what you were talking about in in terms of this entire uh, series preview, the Reds, who of course caught fire really early on, pretty much right after they promoted uh, Dela Cruz who has been a sensation, of course, across baseball this year. And then since then, or since probably the last month, they've slowed down a little bit. But like you said, they remain in contention. So this wasn't going to be exactly a walkover or a pushover of a series in Cincinnati. Uh, and of course, the Friday night game on Apple TV, um, maybe that had something to do with it. But in terms of what happened, it was uh, another disaster uh, in terms of a, a performance offensively. I mean, we know what happened in terms of being shut out. Only three hits that the Blue Jays recorded on the Friday night. And it's just, it's getting difficult and more difficult to talk about it because it just, it remains the same uh, type of problem uh, in terms of people that unfortunately quality at bats just aren't there. And it's been affecting the team's overall performance. Of course, we, we know all of this to this point. This is no surprise to anybody, but of course it was not a good way to start off the series and then going into the Saturday game, you know, not exactly probably as optimistic as you were uh, entering the series. The Jays did, you know, a little bit better, of course, offensively. They had the three-run fourth inning. And then pretty much that next half inning is when they gave up the inside the park home run to De La Cruz. And that pretty much ruined things in terms of what the early lead. But, of course, right after that in the fifth inning, they got back uh, in front. And then, of course, from there, the pitching did well, holding Cincinnati to pretty much the 4-3 or holding Cincinnati – to where they were in terms of only three runs and, of course, securing the Blue Jays' win. And then the big part on Saturday, of course, as well, was the activation of Bo Bichette, who finally returned from his injury. And this was something where 
it just felt like as much as it was only a couple of weeks, this was such a huge move, of course, to bring him back. And we know in terms of since he's been gone and, of course, before the injury, when he was there, just looking at the difference uh, in terms of where this team ranked in numbers, especially at the position itself at shortstop. I mean, pretty much the top of the league um, when Bo Bichette was playing. And then, of course, you saw the really you just as much as we knew um, this was coming, it, just to see it actually happen as well was another thing in terms of how this offense did without him. And pretty much among shortstops, they ranked almost last, I believe, or it was it was at least 25 at best, 25th at best uh, in the league in terms of just overall offensive numbers. So that was definitely something that um, was, of course, noticeable throughout his absence. But again, something that we knew that was coming because Bo Bichette has pretty much been the only consistent hitter on this team uh, throughout the year for the most part. And he has been the best overall player on this team as well this season. So getting him back was also a huge step, of course. Um, he he didn't really it didn't seem like he missed a beat as well when he was down rehabbing in Buffalo and then when he came up this past weekend it was definitely good to see him back in the lineup and then of course on the Saturday or the Sunday game uh, it was pretty much a home run derby in Cincinnati where pre- pretty much everybody was hitting home runs and it was a good way to end off the series and of course it was backed by a really good start uh, from Hunjin Ryu who's pretty much ever since that first start against Baltimore has pretty much been lights out ever since I mean another start where he had zero earned runs and of course this was the start where he struck out the most this season he struck out seven batters um, in the course of that outing and now his ERA is now below two um, this is something that was definitely I guess we didn't really know what to expect in terms of the return of Hunjin Ryu I think something you know along the lines of just being average was something that was going to be doable for Blue Jays fans in, in terms of expectations and just where he was going to slot in, what his role was going to be. That was also something that was kind of a question mark um, heading into the season, knowing by the time August came around, he was going to be an option. And of course, since the demotion of Alec Manoa uh, down at AAA Buffalo, Ryu has pretty much taken over that spot now in terms of the last spot, or the last spot, the fifth starter spot in the starting rotation. And he has been lights out ever since. And pretty much for the most part this season overall in his four starts, he's been very good. And that's definitely been a pleasant surprise, um, despite what we know of pretty much what happened for the season of Alec Manoa this season. So that was also a really good part for me as much as the offense was all over uh, Cincinnati's pitching on the Sunday game. The Ryu start for me was also another uh, big bonus. And of course, we we know what happened or we knew what happened throughout the starting pitching as well throughout um, the weekend as well. Jose Brios pitched well on Friday. Chris Bassett, besides that inside the park home run, even though it wasn't all on him, he also pitched very well. So this was a good starting, of course, a good weekend through the uh, for the starters. And the bullpen, for the most part, did really well. Um, so this was definitely good in terms of the pitching, what has been a common reoccurrence from this pitching and of course expected I think for the most part the offense of course started off terrible but then it it ended off really good every time they it feels like they also go off on these these games where they score multiple runs there's an off day that comes the next day so it doesn't exactly so far it hasn't felt like that's gone in their favor so that's definitely something that's going to be you know I don't know it just it creates the question mark again if we're going to be able to see this offense do it for a second straight game, a third straight game. And of course, we got, we talked about it right off the top, but the Baltimore Orioles are coming up next too. And of course, um, they remain hot. They remain the uh, the first place in the AL East. So we'll see what happens from that. But kind of a bad way to start it, but a, a good way to end it this weekend in Cincinnati. Yeah, it doesn't get easier from here. It only gets harder. And I mean, like I mentioned the White Sox series with Seattle, but like, they have a really, really soft schedule with those games and the Blue Jays have a really tough schedule with Baltimore. And I mean, we know how bad the Blue Jays have been in division and Ryan Mountcastle and like everything that goes into that. So these games are going to be, they were always going to be ultra important, but knowing kind of the context of what's happening around the league and where the Blue Jays are in the standings and the games they now need to make up and that sort of thing, like it is elevated in importance if that's even possible at this point in the season. Uh, but thankfully, they do have some of those guys back from injury. As you mentioned, Bo Bichette in this series going three for 10, two RBI, three strikeouts, a home run in Sunday's game as part of that five home run barrage, including Brandon Bell. I should mention two homers in that game. Um, it's good to see him back. Like, I don't, I, it seems like he's picking up where he left off. Like, obviously, going three for 10 isn't. I guess numbers that jump off the page. Like it's kind of like average what you would expect over the course of a nice season for someone like Bo Bichette. And for him to be able to do that after missing two weeks on the injured list, I'm not going to complain about that any day. Um, and you know, we saw what he was doing in AAA, but AAA is an entirely different conversation. And only two games in a rehab assignment, I don't think that's really enough to get you 
completely up to game speed. Like, obviously, he's pretty darn close, but I don't think he's fully there yet. So um, I was happy with what he was able to do in this series. And yeah, like getting him back to this offense is really important. And you could just see like in the series finale, how much deeper this lineup felt compared to games previous, especially I mean, like the first game of this series, like BGO is batting fourth in Friday's game. And then like, you kind of look at the final score and you see one zero, but you look at the lineup and like, when you have cabin BGO hitting fourth, Matt Chapman is fifth, Kirk six, Varsho, then Espinal and Kiermaier wrapping it up. Like the math makes sense. You have BGO hitting fourth. You're not going to score a whole lot of runs, but then you go to Saturday and Sunday and you have a really good looking lineup, especially Sunday's lineup. I love a lot. You can put Bichette at two and that puts Guerrero four, Springer five, Varsho six. And then Chapman, Jansen, Kiermaier wrapping it out. And a lot of people said this. I agree. That kind of looks like a postseason lineup. It looks like what the Blue Jays would roll out in game one of a wild card. And in games these important, they should be putting their A lineup forward. And so I think I was happy to see John Schneider make that decision. I think we saw it pay off when they went 10 and three in that game. And again, like I'm not expecting any type of consistency any type of the page turning from this point forward. This is what this team is. It's not changing. They are not an offensive powerhouse. They are a pitching first, defense second, and hitting third team. Uh, but it's nice to see that when they put their A lineup forward, they were able to get some runs in. And of course, it also helps along with the injury returns. Yeah, Kevin Kiermaier back as well at the bottom half of the lineup, which we saw pay off in the series finale. It definitely is. And I mean, yeah, you talk about how the lineup started on Friday, knowing that Bo Bichette was on his way back. But of course, you still had to get through that one game without him. And then on top of that, George Springer missed a couple of games. Uh, it was a sore foot, I believe. That's what he missed some time with. And thank goodness it was only precautionary. And uh, he was back in the lineup, of course, on Sunday. So yeah, it was kind of the first time in a while, of course, in weeks where they were actually able to show off that it, that a complete lineup one through nine. And also on kind of the injury watch, Matt Chapman had a, it was like yes, a bruised the finger yeah, from dropping yeah. a weight on his finger. And then also yeah. Danny Jansen was been beat, up. beat up from a week of hit by pitches. So you were missing a lot of guys who contribute to the offense. Exactly. So it's been a while. And of course, again, on that Sunday game, when they were able to be back together, one through nine. Yeah. Like this, for what this team is, this is their, definitely their best line to put forward. Of course, um, I mean, one through nine, it definitely was. And I mean, you saw the results like you were talking about. As much as it's not going to be like that every game, it hasn't been anywhere close to like that every game. It's just on paper when this lineup is being constructed, this definitely is their best looking lineup. And I think the injury, of course, returns for the these other guys that you were mentioning, of course, with Kiermaier, with Jansen, who you're just talk, talking about, with Chapman, and of course, with Springer that I mentioned off the top. Uh, these were also very good reinforcements. And of course, with Kevin Kiermaier, I mean, he was – just overall, he's been having a really good season in terms of what we've seen him because we, of course, we are all familiar with him when he was with the Tampa Bay Rays in the past. But in terms of what he's been doing this season, this has been definitely one of his best offensive seasons. And then, of course, him defensively um, has been a, a game changer for them in the the outfield. Like you talked about, this was something that, unfortunately, while they lost power in the uh, in terms of the lineup in the offseason, this was something that they went out and got in, ter- in somewhat of a different approach with run prevention and just defense uh, in the outfield. And he's been nothing short of that. And, of course, he's been and contributing more offensively than we would have imagined. And, and then, of course, there's been other kind of things that have happened uh, throughout the year where we haven't expected things. And, of course, um, I just examples are pretty much people offensively who have not been, I guess, living up to the standards or living up to the expectations that we all thought was going to be something that was going to happen. Um, and, of course, you, you, I know one of the first names that comes to mind is Dalton Varsho, even though he's been slowly, it feels like he's been playing a little bit better throughout the course of the month, but, of course, not quite there yet in terms of what we were expecting. So that's also one part where, you know, that's been one of the disappointments offensively, but, he's of course, he's been very good defensively. And with Chapman as well, this was kind of the longest stretch this year where we actually didn't see him in the lineup. It's been very rare where he's taken a day off. And of course, it's Santiago Espinal filling in for him uh, and for that time being. And of course, there was definitely, you definitely felt the absence um, of, of course, of Chapman. And this pretty much drifted towards the last part of the homestand as well. And I mean, one game that comes up to, to mind for me, as much as I wasn't on the last episode, it comes up to one of those last games in Cleveland where there was the error. And then pretty much after that uh, from Espinal, it felt like the game was done from there. And it, it just, the game never turned around and the Jays lost that game. So that was kind of, you you just felt the absence of Chapman as much as he hasn't been 
absent a lot this season, uh, pretty much very quickly uh, defensively. So that's been one thing as well, where you kind of notice it with Jansen, you talked about it as well. The guy's been banged up and he just, for some reason, keeps getting hit um, on the wrist slash hand area. And he can't just, it, unfortunately he can't avoid it. Uh, and it's kind of an anomaly of how much it's really happened this year. But of course, uh, his counterpart Alejandro Kirk uh, unfortunately he also hasn't been living up to the standards as well so it's been definitely a down season for him and the absence of Jansen felt more impactful because of the fact that that's happened and Danny Jansen's been very good offensively and he's for the most part as much as he's he's been out of the lineup here and there um, for the most part he has been healthy and he's back to being healthy for the time being which is good but of course Again, you just go back to the biggest absence or the biggest absence in this lineup, which was Bobachet. So I'm glad he's back. And it really, it's pretty hard to pick up right where you left off when you miss some time on the injury list with this. So, yeah, as much as it was a couple of games, uh, only a couple of games down in Buffalo, you can tell by the way his at bats were going. He felt very comfortable. And of course, his return this weekend in Cincinnati again, picking up right where he left off. That's huge. And of course, we talk about the current state, the team, the current wild card race, and everything like that. So that's going to be a huge boost, of course, down the stretch. You know, other than that, pretty much if you go throughout the rest of the lineup as much as, you know, it, it's kind of been the same. And I know you you kind of mentioned Kevin Biggio from that Friday game. He was hitting cleanup. He's been playing a lot better lately as well. But in any situation, you don't want him batting cleanup. And unfortunately, that's the way it was um, on Friday night due to all these circumstances because not everybody was back at the beginning of this series. So I'm glad the reinforcements are back. For the most part, this team has been healthy. And of course, I guess over the course of the last couple of weeks is when they really kind of had at the same time um, all of their injuries happen at once. And if that's the worst that's going to come from it, that's also pretty much a miracle or in terms of an absolute win. So that's, that's a good part that it feels like they're past this now. And of course they're still waiting for some guys to get back. You know, we talk about a guy like Chad green who continue or pretty much had to restart um, his rehab assignment down in Buffalo. So that's also something where they're waiting for him to come back. And for the most part, other than that, this team is somewhat healthy besides of course, what happened with Vladimir Guerrero Jr. on the Sunday game where he kind of left with uh, it was left middle finger discomfort. So that shouldn't be too long. It should be a couple of days. Hopefully he's good to go uh, by tomorrow on the Tuesday game against Baltimore. Uh, but of course, we really don't know how that's going to happen or if that's going to happen or hopefully throughout this series, he is back at some point. It doesn't seem like it's too major. So that's also a good part about that. And for the most part, again, after that, you got a healthy line for the most part of it. And it's time to get back in that playoff race and pick up some more wins. And of course, it's going to be a tough test this week against Baltimore. I don't believe in jinxes, but I will knock on wood before I say this. If this is the most injury riddled the Blue Jays get this season, they have been extremely lucky and extremely fortunate to go through a season where your most serious injury, I mean, maybe outside of Hinge and Ryu, but your most serious injury is losing Bo Bichette for two weeks and like maybe I guess you could toss Jordan Romano in there he was out for a couple weeks but like besides that do you really have much in the way of serious injuries that they've dealt with this year like I feel like that's kind of the extent of it and yeah like you can pinpoint like Kiermaier but I don't think like then you're getting into names which you know they make an impact on this team certainly and having them adds to this team but they're not quite as substantial as someone like Bo Bichette is so all that to say if the Blue Jays get away and finish this season with that being the full extent of their injuries, they are incredibly, incredibly lucky. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's awesome to have almost everyone back now, almost everyone healthy. And yeah, maybe Vladdy is going to be day to day from this point, but hopefully he can return. If not for the start of this series in Baltimore for a little bit later. Um, I'm glad you mentioned, Dal mentioned Dalton Varsho because I think he's quietly very, uh, significantly turned his season around over the last two weeks or so. You look at his stats from the start of July to August 3rd, 27 games, he was hitting 156. He had 25 strikeouts in 77 at-bats, and he only had three extra base hits over that span. Three extra base hits in 27 games. That's pretty abysmal. The 15 games following that, which takes us up to today, takes us up to the end of that series in Cincinnati, he is hitting 311. Total change in his offensive output. And you look at the way his batting average has tracked. It's, it fell all the way to 211. It's gotten up to 222, which, of course, is still not ideal. But that's kind of in line with what he's done in previous years. And that's kind of the offense that the Blue Jays got and traded for and so I know he's going to run hot and cold but 
the Blue Jays are fortunate that what they were getting for about a month there in July is not who Dalton Varsho actually is and not what his season is going to end up being. So he's been, I think, a quiet engine behind this. I don't know. I, I can never call it an offensive resurgence, but this quiet engine in terms of the bottom half of the lineup starting to contribute a little bit more. And even if we aren't totally seeing the results on a big scale, it's uh, nice to have someone um hitting well in the bottom half of the lineup um someone who wasn't hitting well in the bottom half of the lineup is Paul DeYoung and it seems like his tenure with the Blue Jays is already over I find it unlikely that he will remain a Blue Jay he was DFA'd when the Blue Jays brought back Bo Bichette this move really surprised me Jacob and I were talking about who's going to be sent down when Bo Bichette returns from injury and DeYoung wasn't really on the list. I think we mentioned the name as kind of a, if you're doing this on performance alone, you send him down, but the Blue Jays are not going to send him down, or at least that's what we thought. And then of course they DFA him uh, about two weeks after they acquire him at the trade deadline. And I'm kind of shocked. Like, yes, the offensive numbers weren't there. He played 13 games. He was three for 44, zero walks. 18 strikeouts talk about abysmal numbers the numbers were not there they were never there with the blue jays but i i mean they gave up a prospect for this guy they made the move they thought he was a worthwhile addition to this team and they gave up on him after two weeks i'm not saying it's the wrong decision i was just really surprised to see the blue jays do that i thought it was kind of out of character for them yeah i remember briefly with me as well um you talked about or we we talked about in terms of who would go down in terms of when Bobashek comes back and of course I was or you were on the side of Davis Schneider because of the fact that he's young he can go up and down I was more on the side of move on from a guy like Santiago Espinal none of us had this I guess idea that it would be Paul de Young in mind and the entire point of getting Paul de Young was to fill in for Boba Shett in those couple of weeks. And of course, like you said, as much as he's, he's been very good defensively this season, uh, the numbers offensively, yeah, they were never there. I mean, it was atrocious uh, in terms of what, what he did as a blue Jay at the plate. And it was like, you were pretty much went over it only three hits and those many at bats. It was unfortunately just, yeah, it was abysmal uh, in terms of what happened with that. It still surprises me. Like you were talking about, that they did this knowing that of course he was under control for a couple more years. I think it was a couple of team options uh, that he did have. And yeah, I mean, this was something that was definitely shocking uh, in terms of he was the corresponding move for Bo Bichette. I mean, you know, I, I understand people being in favor of the move and, you know, wondering why we'd be shocked by that. And of course, you know, he, he, he made no case for himself to remain on this team. I'm not saying that, but just in terms of the numbers and everything like that, what we were talking about, and people that had more control that can go up and down more frequently and stay on the 40 man roster. It just seemed like the easier move uh, for when Boba came back was to, you know, move on or pretty much send a guy like uh, David Schneider down or whatever it was. So that's why it definitely is surprising. And especially on top of that, because, and this is going to be something that I guess kind of come, you know, intertwines what we're going to talk about later is that David Schneider also isn't getting a lot of at bats now or pretty much over the past couple of weeks. So that's also something that kind of you wonder about a little bit, but of course, just knowing the fact that Paul DeYoung was the one that went or pretty much got DFA'd uh, for Boba Shett coming back. It definitely surprised me a little bit because again, offensively, yes, it was terrible, but he, he also this season has been a very good um, infielder. So that was something where, the entire point of him was to fill in for Boba Shett until he came back. And then you can kind of move him more towards the bench. Maybe he gets some reps at second base, but I mean, that's something of course that never happened. And it also shows to you as well that it definitely felt like a move on the trade deadline day. But now when you look back on it again, it just felt like this was something that they never wanted to do. And it almost felt like they had to try. They felt like they had to do this when Boba Shett did go down. And of course it was the day before the trade deadline when Boba Shett did get hurt. And a lot of people were wondering how quickly or how much that was going to change, you know, the Blue Jays deadline plans. And as much as it didn't, you know, I mean, as much as it did a little bit, of course, because they got the young, maybe, you know, it just also kind of confirms that if Bichette would never went down, this was something that probably would never have happened. And this is something that they, they didn't want to do until pretty much, you know, less than 24 hours before when Boba Bichette did go down. So that kind of also confirms that a little bit in the sense that they had no, you know, they had no use for him, unfortunately, on the roster when Boba Shett did come back. But, you know, knowing that they did give up a prospect, regardless of how highly rated he was or how much promise he did have, you usually 
it's just kind of uncommon that you move on from a guy you traded for not even a month later. So that's something that was definitely a little bit of a, you know, I, it, it was a little eye opening, of course, when you think about it like that. But yeah, I mean, there's no sugarcoating it in terms of this was something that just didn't work out from the get go. And, you know, we'll see what happens as he still pretty much is on waivers or he still was DFA and we're still hearing word if he's going to be claimed or not, but we'll see what happens with that. It, of course, it doesn't necessarily confirm right now his blue Jays 10 years over, but of course it's pretty, you know, you'd feel pretty confident saying that it is at this point. And again, just kind of a bizarre course of events of what happened. And yeah, it was a forgettable month of August for him. And um, yeah, I just, unfortunately it didn't work out. Yeah. For a guy with a team option for 2024 and 2025, like, I have a really hard time seeing him sneak through waivers. Although I've been surprised in the past, there was a Jays pitcher who went down earlier this year, who didn't have options. I forget who it was, but they snuck through waivers and they made it to AAA. And so maybe every other team is seeing the exact same thing the Jays are seeing and that they don't want Paul DeYoung right now. But I think like retrospective two weeks after the fact, it's fair to say, this trade deadline was a failure, right? Or maybe not the trade deadline, but this... Okay, well, let me start with that question. Was this trade a failure? I think so. It's got to be. Yeah, yeah, I I, think so. Like, this guy comes in, gets three hits and 44 at-bats, and then, (laughs) you know, pieces off. He might be going to Buffalo, yeah. Who knows? Yeah, like, he might... He might be going to Baltimore. He might be going to Seattle. He might be going to Houston. Like, (laughs) Like, it's not just... Yeah, I don't, it's absolutely, like, I I don't know. I think this front office is a pretty good front office, but I think they've kind of shown an inability to make big moves at the deadline. I think this move might be, uh, I guess they didn't really give up much for him. Like, that's the saving grace, but I don't know. It's a, it's a massive failure, and I guess my two thoughts on this, uh, or, okay, my three thoughts on this. Let's finish the, okay, do you think the trade deadline was a failure? overall well i remember at the time none of us were happy about it in terms of what happened so and now when you take away that trade with they young it definitely leans more towards that Mm -hmm. i don't yeah failure is it's a strong word overall but i mean it's closer to a failure than it was to a success that's as close as i'll go with that yeah that's a very uh political answer it it is very political i will say it's a failure like, I, I don't think that's bold. I think yeah. most Jays fans are saying it's a failure right now. Like, you look at the names. You get Genesis Cabrera, you get Jordan Hicks, and you get Paul DeYoung. Out of those three guys, Paul DeYoung is already gone, basically. Genesis Cabrera is, I mean, he's been great in his time with the Jays. But to be honest, I don't really even consider that a deadline move because he was claimed off waivers, right? From Like, it's, like it, what Paul DeYoung is going to become for another team is what... Yanis Escobar is to the Blue Jays. So basically, you're looking at Jordan Hicks, who is a great addition, right? This guy just threw the fastest pitch in recorded Blue Jays history. Like, you can't discount what he's done, but also, like, he's not the best reliever. He may have been arguably the best reliever on the market, but, you know, it kind of cost the Jays the game on Friday, or whether you blame that on the offense, I don't know. That's up to you. But, um, yeah, I mean, to to be in the thick of things, to be – so tight in a wild card race and even in a division race, which was like, it was a long shot, but I think it was maybe still within reach if you want to be an optimist and to go out and have your trade deadline consist of Jordan Hicks. To me, that's an abject failure. I don't think you can frame it any other way. Uh, My other thought on this, do you think the Paul DeYoung trade took away from the Blue Jays acquiring that big bat that we all wanted. Like, do you think it was 24 hours to go? They were spinning the wheels. They were getting things going on that power bat that we all wanted on our checklist. And then Bobachek goes down and everything changes. And all of a sudden they kind of have to pivot and change priorities. And all of a sudden they're pursuing someone like Paul DeYoung uh, or, I mean, like Tim Anderson. Like, I don't know who you want to, pin as your kind of shortstop replacement hope but do you think like they had to change things last minute and that's why we didn't get the big move we wanted it definitely had something to do with it i definitely did and i mean of course we all know what happened in terms of they didn't get that bad and i understand that the, the market itself was slow but 
yeah, like you have to imagine that there was a pl- original plan in place before Bichette went down that did not include or that did not involve, sorry, Paul de Young. And then that kind of changed things very quickly. And it felt like, again, it just felt like it was kind of a, a force type of move where they went out to get him to replace Bo Bichette. But of course, on top of that, they didn't get that back that everyone was pretty much see- hoping that they would do because of the fact that this lineup has lacked power. It has lacked, lacked consistently all the above uh, this season. So definitely for me, I have to agree that it, it had something to do with it. It just felt like this kind of threw things off completely from the time that Bo Bichette did go down. And then of course they got Paul DeYoung and now they're pretty much left without any sort of offensive or anybody else in terms of that's going to bring offensive juice to your lineup. That's something that never happened, unfortunately. So yeah, I, I do think it went pretty much towards that path as well. Um, it's just, I definitely would have loved to know what the original plan was or how much they were willing to go. Perhaps they were willing to go a little bit more to spend, to try and get an offensive uh, bat. And of course things probably changed once it, they did get the young, because of course they've already given up a couple of prospects, including the Jordan Hicks trade as well from before. So that's kind of something that's also probably had an impact on that. And then of course they weren't probably willing to go as far as they originally were. And um, you know, as much as, that it that might be the case. We also know that Ross Atkins, of course, was he sounded disappointed. He sounded frustrated as well with his interview on that. And pretty much along with all of us, I think we were frustrated that we didn't get that uh the power bat that the, the Blue Jays were trying to seek out. So that's something that was interesting too. But yeah, for me, like there's no way I don't believe that it didn't have an impact. I think there was something that was there that definitely halted things, or not maybe not halted things, but definitely altered their approach in terms of how they're going to approach this deadline. And perhaps there would have been a more likely move or a more likely scenario where the Jays did end up with a power bat uh, at the end of the day, if Boba Shett never got hurt. Yeah. Um, okay. My final thought on De Young, kind of in combination with what we saw with uh, Alec Manoa, I mentioned that this, the move to DFA De Young surprises me, but I think like when you combine it with Alec Manoa, which is a move that also surprised me, you put those two things together. I think the picture we get is that this is a team that is no longer focused on winning in the future. Or I guess winning in the future is no longer their top priority. I think winning now is now their top priority, which is kind of at odds with what happened at the trade deadline. But sending down Alec Manoa, sending down Paul DeYoung, and potentially losing two good years of his, I guess maybe not his bat, but his defense in the infield. That seems like a move that is saying we are willing to sacrifice those two years of Paul DeYoung to get a better infielder, more playing time right now. And that's David Schneider. That's Kevin Biggio. That's even Santiago Espinal. Like Espinal, as bad as he may have been or is in the past four weeks, he's been playing much better than Paul DeYoung. And it's a low bar. So to me, like these moves indicate that the Blue Jays are now their number one priority is winning now, which again is weird given the trade deadline, which didn't seem to signal that. But I think this move kind of says we don't care about those two years we're losing. We want to win right now. We want to improve the team for right now, which I find interesting. Yeah, it definitely it definitely feels like they change that approach. And for me, like a lot of this as well, I just think of when this team got Matt Chapman, of course, last year. It did. It did feel like now for me that their de- their window was definitely. They definitely made it quicker, and it definitely felt like it was a lot. You know, they wanted to get this done sooner rather than later because of the fact that's kind of when everyone's locked up in the next couple of years, and we know now Matt Chapman is going to be a pending free agent, and of course they still have to pay Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and other people. But yeah, like it definitely did feel like they were fast tracking in terms of the improvement that they were trying to make on that one too. So. It it's all it it is kind of fascinating to see how things kind of transpired through all that point, and of course, it, it just it's definitely odd of how I guess it's not odd, but it's definitely yeah, it was kind of surprising a little bit for me that they it it definitely felt like their window was shorter rather than longer, or you know, trying to win shorter than they were kind of in the long term. So it just feels like this is the best like the last couple of years has been the best versions of themselves as a lineup. Unfortunately, the production hasn't been there this season. And of course, you know that this team came up short last season and then 2021, despite coming up short by the one game, it, it was truly one of the, it was definitely a really fun season to watch uh, in terms of 2021. And I think that was probably 
the best or the most fun I had watching that team and in, in, throughout the last couple of years. And of course, last year had its moments too, but not as fun for me as it was in 2021, even though they missed out of the playoffs by a game in 2021, if that makes sense. But either way, I mean, you look at this year as well. It, it just, it, you know, it definitely feels like there's pressure a little bit in terms of trying to get to that point and to try and, you know, to try and win that world series that we've been hoping that is going to be coming. And hopefully uh, it does come at some point, but I mean, yeah, it definitely feels like they've gone that way. Um, you know, quick, uh, how quickly this team turned things around and kind of how they've transitioned themselves in, into this window that they've been in now. And of course, still trying to get over that hump in terms of winning a playoff series, something that they're still trying to do. And, um, you know, as of right now, again, look pretty much on the outside looking out of a wild card spot. But of course, there's definitely a good chance or a decent chance that they can get back into the playoffs this season. and We'll see what happens. So I definitely feel that as well with the, you know, just kind of the urgency to win sooner rather than later. I don't blame them for that entirely either. But and of course, you look at the AL East as well with the Orioles, pretty much how quickly they've uh, reemerged. The Rays always staying there and kind of a year in terms of what it's been, what's been a down year for a team like the Yankees, perhaps this is their opportunity as well um, this season to do that thing. So I do, I do agree with you on that one. And, you know, it, it's hard to tell how it's going to end up this year, just because of, unfortunately, this team has been hard to read, but it's something that's going to be fun, I guess, in the last couple of months. And we're just praying that they can finally catch fire and make some havoc towards the playoffs and potentially in the playoffs. We just haven't seen that yet. So I do definitely agree with you on that one. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I'm not even like I'm not gonna repeat ourselves. Like, we pray, we pray for change. Um, okay, I guess like the last final thing to touch on. Uh, a lot of people complaining about Davis Schneider's uh, playing time right now. It, it's kind of a weird situation where like, again, like you were giving at bats to someone like Paul DeYoung and Kevin Biggio, who Biggio has been phenomenal, but. Uh, it seems like David Schneider will have a good game and then he'll be sent to the bench for a week. That's kind of been the pattern. Like he had his insane series in Boston. Uh, he starts the first game of the series after that in Cleveland and he gets a day off. It's like, why are you giving this guy a day off after he just went nine for 17 in his first four major league games? And then uh, a couple of games at the end of that Cleveland series. And then he has one game against Chicago and then, a single at bat between August 12th and August 19th, one at bat pinch hitting in a game against Phillies uh, in the ninth inning and uh, nothing comes of it. He strikes out. Um, and then of course he comes back in the series. Uh, he has, you know, a good game on the 19th against Cincinnati. He has uh, one hit and that one hit is a home run. Uh, he also has three strikeouts. So I guess there's that against him, but a lot of people complaining about his playing time. I want to hear from you. Uh, do you think those complaints are warranted? Like, do you think the Blue Jays should be giving him more consistent playing time? Or do you think they've kind of figured it out? Are they giving him the right amount when you have a lot of other names in the mix who can do a lot of the similar things, whether that's Kevin Biggio, whether that's Santiago Espinal, whether that is sometimes going to be Whit Merrifield. And of course, we when you have Kiermaier back, the situation in the outfield, like Kiermaier goes to center, and then you move Varsho, and then Merrifield might be out of spot, and then Merrifield might have to move to the infield, and then Bo's back, so you're cutting out an infield spot. So, like, the pieces are moving, and it's harder to find a spot for David Schneider right now. But do you kind of subscribe to this thought that he's not getting consistent enough playing time? Well, it definitely hasn't been consistent, unfortunately. But, like, yeah, like you've been talking about, this team has been getting healthier, and it's kind of been a little bit more difficult to find room for him, of course, pretty much since that weekend in Boston, it acts, it hasn't exactly been the best, uh, of course, performance from him on that one. I mean, pretty much hitless in that entire Cleveland series when he did, he did get an opportunity. And then he got the one game in the last homestand against the Cubs where he did go one for three. And then, of course, the one game against Philly where he went oh, you know, oh for one and then the Cincinnati game. So, yeah, it's been kind of up and down, up and down, up and down uh, since that Boston and even that Cleveland series where he played three out of the four games. And unfortunately, it hasn't been ever since then. He just, yeah, he hasn't been playing consistently. And it's hard in terms of, you know, I would have liked to see how he would have responded if he was playing more consistently because, again, he goes through that stretch in Cleveland pretty much, which was completely different than he did in Boston. And then he didn't get an opportunity until just one game in the Chicago Cubs series where he did get to play. And then he had to sit for another four, four days. And then he had to sit for another three days. So if he had consistent at bats, I do wonder, you know, 
it, how quick, more quickly, or, you know, if he got out of that, if he was going to get out of that slump more quickly, um, you know, and just not knowing, we still don't exactly know as well, because of course he only had that one game in Cincinnati where he did go one for four, but of course he, you know, he pitched, or sorry, he pitched, he played very well um, throughout that time. I think he had a couple of good at bats as well in that Cincinnati series. So it hasn't been consistent in terms of his playing time. You know, his performance other than the Boston series has also kind of fallen off a bit. So it's kind of hard to tell. And for me, you know, I don't necessarily have a huge issue with it. I definitely would have liked to see a little bit more than that. And of course he's going to get to that point where he's going to try and push for more playing time. Of course, basically since he's been called up, he's, he's gone 11 for 30 um, pretty much as a rookie right now. And those are in his games that he's played. So started off good in terms of consistency as well as his performance. And hopefully at some point throughout this Baltimore series, he, he gets in at least one of those games. But for me, like, I don't necessarily have a huge issue with it because of course he is young and he's going to go through these ups and downs. But of course, I also don't think it's doing him any good as well that he's sitting on the bench for four days, um, kind of just stewing on what happened in terms of his last at bat or his last game. So it's kind of, a, it's an odd kind of scenario. And of course, like we've been talking with the teams a lot healthier now too. So the playing time is going to be a little bit more difficult to get uh, when you look at it now. And of course, with Dalton Varshow playing better, he's gonna he's getting a lot more left fielder at bats, and then Whit Merrifield's kind of going over to second base. Something that we didn't, you know, when Dal- when Kevin Kiermaier, like you talked about, was on the IL, it was Merrifield who was going over to left field for the most time, and that kind of opened a spot. It was if it was going to be Espinal, Biggio, or Schneider, and now that this team's healthy and Varshow has been putting up pretty good at bats as well throughout the month of August, it is difficult to slide him in there, um, pretty much. And of course, with Bobochet back being healthy, so yeah, I mean. As much as the playing time has been limited, I understand it. I'd like to see him, you know, perf- you know, I guess appear in more games. Yes, but of course, at the same time, it's you got to understand is, is pretty much how how difficult it is in terms of when this lineup is healthy. So I don't have a problem with it, but hopefully, that it is something that we do see down the line. I want to see him kind of you know, how he reacts to all this in terms of his ups and downs because it started off perfect for him basically, and then it kind of went. A little bit. I don't want to call it rock bottom, but it definitely slowed down right away after that Cleveland series. So, yeah, I I, I get it in terms of the concerns from people or kind of the crit- criticism that he that he hasn't been in the lineup as much as they may you know maybe thought. But at the same time, I just it was something that never kind of it, it never really surprised me due to the fact that this team was getting healthier and the reinforcements were on their way. Yeah, it's like, are you going to take away at bats from? Dalton Varsho, who's hitting over 300 in his last 15 games. Whit Merrifield, who has been absolutely phenomenal. A great table setter at the top of the lineup. Or, I mean, I guess like Bo Bichette, who's Bo Bichette. Like, you're not going to take away a bats from him. Like, who, if you want John, or excuse me, Davis Schneider to be in the lineup every single day, or at least more consistently, like, who are you taking away at bats from? And honestly, I think Kevin Biggio is more effective than David Schneider is right now. And that's not a knock against David Schneider because Schneider has had an absolutely stellar start to his major league career. It's just like, go back to the Paul DeYoung conversation. This is a team that is now focused on winning. That is the decision they have made. Go for it right now. We're willing to sacrifice other things to be winning in the moment and make a push in August and September. And so yeah, like give the at bats to whoever is the most effective. And right now, David Schneider is not that guy. He's great off the bench. He is great to come in a game here and there and hit a home run in Cincinnati. That's phenomenal. But uh, right now, he's not going to be the top guy. He's not going to be the top of the list to come in and take away at bats from someone like Whit Merrifield or someone like Dalton Varsho or Bo Bichette. He's just not. Um, and so I'm completely fine with him getting spotty at bats because it means this team is healthy and that's something I can live with. Um, Okay. Three games against the Baltimore Orioles. It is going to be, if not the most important series of the season, because I think that might be a bit of an exaggeration, uh, especially now that the Blue Jays aren't really going head to head with the Orioles in any sort of competition. It is going to be bottom line, a very, very important series for the Blue Jays. Three games that they uh, would like to win all three. They'd like to win two of three. If they could win one of three, uh, honestly, I think they would kind of just tip their hats and take it. Uh, This is going to be a very tough series. The pitching matchups are going to be Yusei Kikuchi versus Grayson Rodriguez on Tuesday. Rodriguez has a 5.44 ERA. It's going to be Kevin Gosman against the newly acquired, or I guess 
two, three weeks ago now. Jack Flaherty with a 4.73 ERA. And then in the series finale on Thursday, it's going to be Jose Barrios versus Dean Kramer with his 4.5 ERA. Uh, Bryson, who are you going with? What's your series prediction? Every time these two teams have played each other this year, um, I continue to fall for the trap that the Jays are going to win the series. Let's try something different. I will sacrifice being wrong in terms of my predictions to see if they can actually do it this week. I'm going to say they take one out of three. I'm not doing it for, I'm not falling for the same, you know, I guess trap that I've been doing all year. So um, I'm going to go one out of three and I'm going to say that they only win the Wednesday game. So they only win game two of Gosman pitching. Okay, a little bit of pessimism. Uh, against the Orioles, I completely understand it. But uh, keeping that in mind, I think, uh, yeah, I think I'll be a bit optimistic. Uh, I'll go they take two of three, and I'll have them, let's see, I'll have them win Tuesday with Kikuchi on the mound because he's been on an insane roll as of late six consecutive starts of five plus innings or four plus innings and one earned run or less tied with a franchise record he could claim the franchise record if it continues tomorrow so i'm gonna bet on kikuchi so i say the jays win that one and i think it honestly it's a bit of coin toss between gosman and Brios, but i will go just based on opponent era that they win wednesday with gosman on the mound and they lose thursday so i go two of three and we are waiting word from Jacob. He says that they win two of three and lose the third game. So he's going the same prediction as I am. Uh, but Bryson, you're the outlier on this one. So we'll see what happens. Uh, everyone's holding steady after this series in Cincinnati. Uh, we all went two and one. I said they would lose game three. Bryson, Jacob, you guys said they would lose game two. Turns out none of us were perfect. They lost game one. So we all get three points from the series. So Bryson, you're still in the lead at 59. I'm in second at 56. And Jacob is at 41. Um, okay. Fun series in the Queen City. And now you go to the East Coast. You go to Baltimore. And it's going to be nothing but tough luck for the Jays. They're going to have to grin and bear their way through it. We're looking forward to it regardless of the result. As always, you can support our podcast by going to the links below this episode. You can find everything to do with us. That's our Instagram, our TikTok, our Twitter. Our bias a coffee page, the link to join our Discord, our YouTube. Uh, if you're watching these episodes on YouTube, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcast, uh, wherever you listen. Um, and as always, we're looking forward to a series finale and an episode after this series against the Orioles. We'll catch you then. <laughs>